Bonjour tout le monde, merci, merci pour l'invitation, merci pour le prix, c'est vraiment euh, un, un réel honneur en fait. Euh, je sais qu'il ne faut pas reprendre là, les, les introductions, mais en fait je suis maintenant la directrice du Centre de Pazamer depuis hier, fait que je suis vraiment contente, fait que je vous le dis, je vous passe l'information. Donc aujourd'hui, je vais vous parler d'imagerie multimodale dans le maladie d'Alzheimer, surtout dans la phase préclinique. Ma conférence va être en anglais, mais si vous voulez, il y a une séance de questions après, fait que soyez bien à l'aise de poser vos questions en français. So today the talk will be divided in three main sections. So first of all, we're going to talk about early detection of Alzheimer's disease. So this is really related to my Canadian research share, and it's the main focus of what we're doing in the lab. And then the second part will be related to what can we do to try to prevent this disease, so modifiable risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And then after that, in the third part, I will present you one study. So, you know, I really believe that, I'm kind of giving you the take home in advance, but for me, Alzheimer's disease is something that don't start at 65 years of age. It's something that probably start way earlier in life. And I think that is something that I would like to do in my lab, but try to go earlier in time and then see what's happening maybe even kind of in, you know, in young adult that would have a genetic predisposition of Alzheimer's disease. So that's going to be the main focus of the talk. So just so we are on the same page, so Alzheimer's disease is really defined with this, um, you know, kind of having both the pathology in the brain, so amyloid and tau, and then also having the clinical expression of the disease. So memory impairment that progress over time leading to other type of cognitive deficit. So you need to have both to be sure that you, to, for us to be sure that you have Alzheimer's disease. Not that long ago, we were confirming Alzheimer's disease at autopsy. Now we have pretty good biomarker to look at the pathology in the brain in vivo. And this is what really what my lab um, is looking at. There is a lot of debate in the field of, you know, kind of really what is Alzheimer's disease, what are the causes or things like that. But one prevalent hypothesis is that amyloid probably start about 20 years before we give a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in clinic. Amyloid will lead to the spreading of tau, so you can probably have tau in your brain Most of us probably actually have tau in our brain, but, the, but when you start to get amyloid, it's when the tau start to spread and then become really neurotoxic. This will lead to atrophy of the brain, cognitive impairment, and again, usually it's when you have quite advanced mild cognitive impairment, sometimes dementia, that we will say in clinic that you have Alzheimer's disease. Now, there are two main forms of Alzheimer's disease, so the sporadic one, so the one that we all know about, individuals that are usually 65 years old and older. Um, and then um, there is also one form of, so the other form of the disease is a genetic aggressive form of the disease. So if you have one of the gene, you will develop the disease for sure. And even though if, you know, some people argue that maybe it's not exactly the same disease, I think it's a wonderful model to try to understand the preclinical phase of the disease because we can know for sure who has the genetic mutation and who will progress to Alzheimer's dementia within a few years. So the main biomarker for Alzheimer's disease are the fluid ones. So if you do a lumbar puncture, you can take cerebral spinal fluid information, look at amyloid and tau. What now we have um, plasma marker also to look at this protein in the brain, also to look at atrophy, so marker of atrophy in the blood. Um, sorry, not in the brain, but in the blood. And then, of course, today the talk will mainly discuss about neuroimaging. So in neuroimaging, we are um, in my lab mainly interested in MRI and then PET scan. We use all of these Modality, but today I'm going to really talk to you about structural MRI and then also amyloid PET and then tau PET. What you need to know is that when I started my PhD, there was no marker for amyloid and tau in the brain. So when I decided to do my first postdoc, the amyloid PET was just available. So it's why I decided to go to UC Berkeley to use that technique. And when I started my lab, actually, the tau was just becoming available. And that was quite exciting, right? Because can you imagine you want to study a disease and then suddenly they kind of discover a way to really look at it in vivo, so to check what is in the brain um, for real. So that was a very exciting time, and then we're super happy because we are one of the, the places in the world, actually, that started doing tau imaging at the earliest moment in research. So I'm going to repeat that on the next slide, but really, you know, for me, amyloid and tau are the pathology of the disease, and then other neuroimaging markers for me are used to stage the progression of the disease. So the more atrophy, the closer you are, for, exa for example, to develop cognitive impairment. So when I started my lab, there was a big, big debate in the field about is amyloid and tau when you're cognitively normal? 
are they risk factor for the disease or should we say that they are the disease per se? And then mild cognitive impairment and dementia are more kind of the clinical expression of the disease. And then, I mean, it was challenging because, so, you know, I'm going to make big claims, don't be bad about me, but Canadians like to say that it's risk factor. And then in the U.S., a lot of people like to say that it's actually, it's the disease per se. So there is kind of this big debate. So I'm a Canadian trained in the U.S., so what do you do with that? So I went, so I'm more a believer that when you have the pathology, you have the disease, and then after that, you know, if you follow the person over time and the person doesn't die, then probably this person with amyloid and tau will develop the cognitive impairment. So the first thing that I did when I started my lab was to start amyloid and tau within the preventative cohort to test this hypothesis that takes years to, take, to test, right? And we just have the first result of that, and this is what I will present you right now. So these are the um, kind of, I mean, it's not the American criteria, it's kind of the consensus criteria, but really not everyone agree with them. And then what they're suggesting is that in research, if you have, have, Alzheimer's, if you have amyloid, you're on the path of Alzheimer's disease. If you have both amyloid and tau, then we can say that you have Alzheimer's disease. And then if we add atrophy to that, then it's just another layer saying that you are more advanced within the disease. So this is a preventative cohort as it was introduced. So a big cohort at McGill University. We are studying individuals that were all cognitively unimpaired when they were registered within the study. Um, they all had a family history of Alzheimer's disease, so we believe that they were at higher risk of developing dementia. And then we have right now 67 of them that progressed to mild cognitive impairment and dementia. So here are the results. Um, so what we, what we did here is that, so between 2017 and 2018, we did 260 PET scans, so 130 for amyloid, 130 for tau. And then what we did is that we categorized individual based on the one that would have both amyloid and tau, just amyloid, just tau, or um, none of these biomarker. And then what you can see is, Within a follow-up, you know, follow-up was hard with the COVID, but the results are that within a follow-up of about two to three years, 62% of the individual that at the time of the PET scan, when they were absolutely cognitive normal, some of them didn't even have a cognitive complaint, 62% of that group did progress to mild cognitive impairment and dementia within two to three years compared to 3% of the one with only amyloid, and then again, kind of, you know, little percentage within the other group. Um, some of you might think, oh, well, then, you know, like, amyloid is not important, it's really tau, we can discuss about that. I completely disagree, but this could be a good point of discussion. Now, what about if we split them further? I mean, of course, these are small group, right? But what about if we say, okay, you need amyloid, it's cognitively normal again. You need amyloid, tau, and atrophy, a little bit of hippocampal atrophy, then we boost this number to 80%. So almost all of the one that were cognitively normal with these three abnormal biomarker progressed to mild cognitive impairment within two to three years. So for us, strong suggestion that if you have the pathology and you're cognitively normal, you are really in trouble. For me, this is not just a risk factor. It's probably, you know, if we follow them over time, and we will, uh, my guess is that all of them will have progressed to dementia within about 10 years. This is another way to visualize the data. So um, the I'm sorry, the orange line here is representing, again, these individuals with both pathology. And what we say is that within about two years, half of them did progress um, to mild cognitive impairment. One thing that I would like to give as a message within this talk is that often in research, we find things, but then they're not replicable, right? So one thing that we try to do in the lab is that when we have a finding, and we think it's important for clinic or for research or for both, we try to replicate it. So when we, got, when we found these results, we send them to researchers in the field with similar cohort. We ask for their data. There are not that many cohorts that have been following cognitively normal individuals over time for that long. Um, and then, so here are three cohorts uh, that we got the data from, and we replicated the result within all of them. Another way to look at the data, so if we go again with the one with amyloid, tau, and atrophy, in two of the three cohorts, all the participants developed mild cognitive impairment or dementia. In the third cohort, the criteria for mild cognitive impairment were a little bit different. They were not done on um, kind of consensus clinical review, which is what we are doing in the Prevent AD um, and what was done in the other courts. So we think it's why the, um, you know, kind of it's, it's performing well, West, well, good. We think that the criteria for MCI were a little bit different within that last court, but still, right? Replication across three cohorts. 
Um, so in summary for this first part, so, you know, again, if you, for those of you studying Alzheimer's disease, for those of you, for example, working with the ADNI data, there's kind of two ways to look at the data, right? You can go with the diagnosis, which is what people, most people are doing. You can go with the pathology. Um, you can also go with both. So what I would suggest, if you want to talk really, if you want to be sure that it's Alzheimer's disease, maybe you want to go with both. So having cognitive impairment plus the pathology, but you need to know that there's a mismatch between these two things, right? About 20% of of clinically diagnosed Alzheimer's disease patients don't have the pathology, so it cannot be Alzheimer's disease. It's something else. And then also about 30% of cognitively normal older adults are walking in the street. Some of us are maybe here today with their brain full of amyloid and tau. So this is really something to keep in mind. Now, amyloid, an amyloid PET scan costs about 3K, so you are doing them at Sherbrooke, we are doing them at McGill University. If you want to do two, it's 6K, you want to do an MRI on top of that, and so on and so on. So we need to develop other biomarkers to capture this pathology in vivo. So in the lab, we're looking at CSF, of course, but it's a little bit invasive, it's a little bit, we have less participants that want to do it, and we're also working with a group in Sweden to develop, uh, I mean, they are developing a blood biomarker, so it's probably where the field is going. So for me, the PET will always have the advantage that we can can look in the brain, where is the pathology, but other biomarkers could be used, for example, for screening tool to decide to whom we should do a PET scan. Okay, so that was the first part. So this is exactly what we're doing. So trying to figure out who will progress the disease to Alzheimer's disease, dementia or MCI, when they are cognitively normal. And the more information we have, the easier it is to make this prediction. Now, now that I have scared you a little bit, maybe, maybe not, but um, for those of us aging, I guess that it's a little bit scary, I think. The good news is that we do have a time window to try to prevent the disease, right? We have about 20 years to try maybe to stop or remove amyloid. Okay, so now everyone will say, but the amyloid, you know, kind of therapy don't work and so on. Again, another point of discussion. I'm happy to discuss about that. But I think that the point here is that we can still do something when the person are developing atrophy and so on, but they are cognitively normal. So what can we do at that stage? But the other question would be, which factor might influence the appearance of um, these pathology in the brain? So this is a big axe of research in my lab, and it was mainly motivated by some work that uh, I did when I was uh, doing my postdoc, lead by one of my best friends, Miranka Wirth. And then what, what we were, what we were discussing back in Berkeley is that, so the main genetic risk factor for sporadic Alzheimer's disease is being APOE4. And then if you look at the group level of cognitively normal older adult, the one, the group with APOE4 will have amyloid in their brain. So this is kind of what you're seeing on the upper level. So it's a group, just a group level um, expression of the mean amyloid within APOE4 carrier. Again, cognitively normal, right? If you look within non-APOE4 cognitively normal, most of them will not have amyloid. However, this is at the group level, but at the individual level, we know that there are some APOE4 carrier that don't have amyloid in their brain. So one of the questions was, why could that be it? So we looked at different factors, and then what we found is that if you have, so some lifestyle factor seems to counteract your genetic um, background. So the negative impact of the genetic. So if here you look at the upper right um, brain there, you are seeing a group of APOE4 carrier that throughout their life were doing a lot of highly important intensive cognitive activity. So what I mean by that is, you know, being here today. So we control for education within that study, but still the idea is the same, attending to conferences, reading newspaper, you know, kind of being, um, knowing about the literature, reading books and things like that, versus someone that would do less intellectual activity. So suggesting that really you can do things to try to to at least maybe postpone the accumulation of amyloid. So when I started my lab, this is one of the first things that we decided to look at. And then this is work from Michelle Gonneau, wonderful postdoc that was with me. Now she's back in Caen. And then uh, she found that within the Prevent AD, um, increased education, so more education was related to less amyloid in the brain. Here is another way to visualize the data. We just did split the participant and we're showing, again, kind of the, you know, like, so that, 
individual lower years of education do have more amyloid within their brain. What Julie wanted to do at that time is that she said, let's take the one with the genetic mutation and see if we can replicate that. And then a lot of us, maybe including me a little bit, thought that, you know, it wouldn't work because the genetic mutation in these individuals with autism, all dominant Alzheimer's disease is so aggressive that we know that they will develop the disease. But she found the exact same association. So despite the fact that this second group will develop Alzheimer's disease, dementia, probably the one that are highly educated, they will... It will be possible for their brain, if we want to, to postpone the disease for a few years. So quite encouraging. Other factor that have been associated with the pathology, so um, repetitive negative thinking that was uh, found in two different courts with amyloid and tau. So let's say that I'm giving a talk today and then I'm thinking, oh no, you know, like the talk was not good. And then all day long, I'm thinking about that. That would be ruminations. So that would be bad, actually. So putting me more at risk of developing um, amyloid and tau. And then eventually also cognitive decline in older age. Vascular risk factor. So this is something that have been shown over and over by us and others that have not been replicated within all the studies. And one factor could be that they are, you know, this is all complex, right? So if you take, for example, medication, so statin, for instance, maybe it's buffering this association. So it's not just that the risk factor will influence your chance of developing amyloid and tau, but probably there are other factors kind of playing a role there. And, you know, I'm talking like if, you know, it's a cause, but of course these are all association, right? So now what we need to do is that we need to follow individual forever to try to see what is really the cause and the consequence. One last one that I want to show here. So, um, so this is one of the latest studies. So, you know, people that are mindful, so doing some mindfulness, so being here in the present moment, um, you know, like the best example of that is when you go to a park with your dog or your kids, you know, like they're just looking at what's happening, you know, kind of, and then just enjoying the present moment when sometime you are there thinking about your job and things like that. So the kid is doing the good thing. So he's really kind of in the present moment. So this seemed to be extremely, extremely good as a protective factor, both for the pathology and also for cognitive decline over time. So if we would want to do an intervention, Maybe this is a one way to go. Now, one last study on this um, topic of protective risk factor. So if we look at what has been done in the field in terms of prevention, it seems that targeting one factor alone might not work that well. We think that probably the way to go is to try to do intervention that look at multiple factor at the same time. We think that um, we can, we think that you know, the genetic proportion of Alzheimer's disease is probably about two-thirds, and we think that there's a good third there that we could probably prevent. And then the idea here is by, that by combining different factors, modifiable factors, this is probably the way to try to slow down the disease. So this is work by um, Alexa Pichet-Binet that is now uh, doing a postdoc in Sweden. And then what she decided to do is to use a multivariate analysis, take all the information that we had at that time within the prevent AD and look at which combination of factor might also be related more with amyloid and tau, and then also ask the question, is it the same combination of factor? That was done before we collected the mindfulness, but I can tell you that if we redo that with the mindfulness, the mindfulness is the main driver of these analyses. The second one would be perseverative negative thinking, which unfortunately both of them are not within these analyses, but I think it's still good to know. She also, so she did that within the Prevent AD and then within Dian. And then the way it worked kind of quickly um, is that, so she did, so, you know, if you're looking, for example, at the behavioral matrix, so like every participant would be a row. And then after that, you have all the behavioral factor one after the other. So like the first square, for example, that is pretty small here would be the first participant. How much does he or she express this first behavior? And then so you do that for the behavior. You do that for the amyloid. So for the amyloid, for example, we extracted amyloid within 74 um, cortical region. Um, and then so every column would be amyloid burden within one brain region for a participant, and so on and so on. And then you um, correlate these two matrices together, and then what you get at the end of that is are some latent variables that are related to the pathology in the brain. 
So let me walk you through the result. It's a little bit easier to understand. So here would be all the factor, right? And then their weights in the model. And then what you're going to see here are kind of, you know, the factor that are more influencing the model in the upper part. And then where are these associations between these factor and then the pathology? Where is it in the brain is expressed on the brain there? And then for those of you working with amyloid, what you can see is that it's really in the brain region where we do expect the pathology to be. So as Gigano showed, so lower year of education, and then in this case, also more neuroticism be related with more amyloid uh, almost throughout the brain. For tau, different combination of factors. So these are the same factor, but again, the weight of all of these factors are a little bit different. And then what we see actually is that now personality seems to play a role within um, these associations. Also, psychiatric factors, so more apathy, more stress, uh, being related with more tau. And then again, the predominant associations are in brain regions such as the internal cortex. Makes sense. It's a region where we see the more tau in cognitively normal individual. In Diane, they had less factor, but still association were found with psychiatric factor and education um, within, again, these individuals with a genetic um, aggressive form of the disease. And again, all of them are cognitively normal. Some might say, well, but you know, maybe they are experiencing cognitive decline, so they are more stressed, they are more anxious. No, there was no difference between um, the level of anxiety, for example, within the dian cord between the mutation carrier and the non-mutation carrier. So I cannot refute that hypothesis, but I really think that there is something going on in the brain. You know, the pathology actually starts to accumulate in brain regions that are um, important for depression, anxiety, and so on. So there's probably kind of this mix of, um, you know, the, the pathology and the expression of these factors at the same time. So the factor are probably a cause and a cause consequence, that would be my take home. So to close on this second um, section, so there are a lot of factors that I believe we can try to modify early in life in order to try to reduce our risk of Alzheimer's disease. And where do we want, or the accumulation of the pathology, if you want to. Most of these factors have also been associated with increased risk of progression to dementia. So this is not exactly what we're studying in the lab, but it makes also sense with that literature. Now, where do we want to go from there? Well, I think, again, it's kind of important to see how far in time should we go. Cholesterol is probably a good thing to control it at 60 years old, but should we try to measure it when we are in with our 30, 40? Should we try to control it in a more aggressive way? So I think that this is what we need to start thinking about that. Sex differences, right? Like vascular risk factor for men and women are not the same. I mean, yes, they are the same, but you know, some are more prevalent in men, some are more prevalent in women and things like that. So maybe like diving into that a little bit more. And then, of course, like I'm kind of presenting a lot of stuff from my lab, but if you want a very good review on that, um, here would be one. Okay, now last section of the talk. So again, I mean, one thing that really interests me is, okay, that's good. I mean, you know, like we talked a lot about the pathology. What else, right? Like, you know, are there things happening when you're still cognitively normal? Um, and then the question here was really, let me skip to that, but the question here was really, well, you know, could individuals that have a genetic predisposition of Alzheimer's disease, particularly the one with autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, could they be aging faster? That was kind of the question of that last section. So when we do our study, we often look at age, and then we look at like how, you know, how many years since you were born. But it's actually striking when you're in clinic and then you have someone in front of you that is 60 years of age. Some of them just look like if they are 75. I mean, other look like if they are 55. And often you realize that the, how old they look like is actually quite related to how impaired they are cognitively. I mean, twin studies have shown that the twins that look older often die sooner and have more cognitive impairment. And then if we look at the literature, I mean, so one way to do that is to look at the, you know, wrinkles and things like that. So we have done that in the lab. So far, we found nothing. But another way to look at that is also to look at the brain. And there have been a lot of models in the field that have been built um, looking at structural brain characteristic of the brain. And then what these models suggest is that 
people that have dementia, mild cognitive impairment, multiple sclerosis, so different type of disease, their brain look older than what they are supposed to look like. Now, we decided to ask this question again within the preclinical phase of the disease, looking at genetic variant of the disease, um, and also amyloid because we had, it within the, we had this information within the prevent AD um, and the DIAN cohort. But then here, instead of going with structural scan, which because we believe that structural changes arrive quite late in the course of the disease, we decided to build a model of brain age based on functional feature of the brain. Because... There is a literature suggesting that maybe functional changes appear actually quite early within the course of the disease. So the last project was really, it's kind of, let's say, two papers in one, in the sense that building the model was really kind of the hardest part. And then after that, testing the hypothesis um, was the second part of the project. So if you want to build a model like that, I mean, you need a lot of data. So we tried to see which type of data with resting state uh, fMRI data were available. So we took all these data set, and then we took kind of a main part of the data to train our model. Then after that, we took a validation set from a completely independent court to tweak our model. I'm going to walk you through that in one second. And then finally, when we were absolutely done building the model, so building the model took months, and then when we were done building the model, we said, okay, enough, we don't touch the model anymore. And then we tested the model within this test set. And this is a very important step because, you know, like people, they always want to kind of bonify their model. They want their model to be better and better. But if we want to have a biomarker, if we want a biomarker that we can translate into clinic, we really, the biomarker will be developed somewhere else, right? So you really want something that is generalizable. So there will be a cost, of course, of your prediction, but we hope that we can take the biomarker and then again using, use it within different um, settings. Just another way to look at um, the data. So we had cohorts spanning over the lifespan. The prevent AD, of course, people are like the participants are older. The Dian core, they are a little bit younger. And I'm going to fly through the method, but if you are interested, um, so the, if you go on YouTube, there is, so I gave a talk on that um, at the Nylon Day in uh, 2020. You can also read the paper. <laughs> so basically, we took all the fMRI scan, we pre-processed them uh, with NYAC, so uh, developed by Pierre Bellec at Montreal University, um, parsed the brain of every individual in 239 nodes using the Power and Peterson Atlas. We could have used a different atlas, extracted the time series from each parcel, created correlation matrices for each individual, extracted graph theory from these matrices. We, why did we decide to go with graph theory and then not all kind of the feature that we could have used within these metrics? Because I'm a big believer that, again, if we want something that is generalizable, we need to have a model that is as simple as possible. These graph metrics, we picked them because in the literature they were associated with age of Alzheimer's disease. And then we created the um, neural network. So this would be kind of, for example, the structure of the smallest network that we created. So here we have um, five inputs, so five feature, five graph theory metrics, if you want to, one. Um, and then, so, so yeah, so that would be kind of the, the, what the kind of the simplest model would look like. Now, the, the way that we looked at the performance of our model was to look at the root mean square error. So the yellowish, so the more blue the square there, the better the performance in our training set of the model. So you might be tempted looking at that to say, hey, we're going to take this very complex model and it's going to work super well. It will work super well, but only within your training set. If you try this model in a completely different data set, new participant, new data, it's going to crash. It's not going to predict age um, within this new data set. So with that, these are the results. So we decided to go with a model that was generalizable within our test set. So again, participant not used to train the model. Um, and this is kind of the architecture of, the, of our model. People always ask me which graph theory were included in your final model. So here are the ones that they are. But you know, one, one problem that I see working with these kind of model with deep learning is that you don't exactly know, like, what's happening, right? So, like, if we try to, you know, correlate these metrics with, like, pathology or so on and so on, we found nothing. So, like, you know, there's, I cannot tell you more about these graph metrics except from the fact that they were the feature predicting brain age, functional feature predicting brain age within our model. Okay, now to the result. Time is flying. So, 
Um, so in our test set, so where we did train the model, so we were able to explain about 50% of the variance. So the way to read this graph is really that the, you have the real age of the person, you have the predicted age of the person, and then you're hoping for the best correlation, right? But my idea here is that the correlation cannot be perfect because between individuals, some factors such as a genetic predisposition of Alzheimer's disease should make us, should make our brain look different, right? So we're looking for a good prediction, but I'm not expecting a perfect prediction. Now in the validation set, same thing, about 50% of the variants explain. What about the test set? So what about this set that we kept apart that included, I should have said it, but the individual with the genetic mutation of autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease, also some APOE4 carrier within the prevent AD. Well, I mean, the performance is not as good, but it's still explaining 36% of the variants. So we were quite happy about that. Reviewer gave us an hard time because this is less good than the structural predictive model. But one challenge with that study, but again, I think it's a move to go to bring in these biomarker within the clinic, was really that we pull different data set together. And I also think that building a brain age model with functional data is, um, is harder um, than building a structural one just because, you know, these are more dynamic um, brain feature. So as the last part, what about, um, you know, so like our individual that are currently normal with the genetic predisposition of Alzheimer's disease causing it or a risk factor, do they have accelerated brain aging? And then similarly, is AMWID, for example, related to accelerated brain aging? So what we found is, and actually, sorry, just before I go there, so here you have in DIAM and in the prevent AD, the, the real age, so in, in gray, and then the predicted age in uh, color. And then what we found is that so within Diane, the one with the genetic mutation do, as a group, show accelerated brain aging when compared to the non-carrier. And then this was somewhat influenced by amyloid, um, but I don't think it's completely driven by amyloid. I think that based on these results, I think that the genetic um, predisposition is way more important than amyloid. So I, my belief here is that, you know, like this accelerated brain aging um, is probably happening in parallel or even prior to the amyloid. But of course, like, you know, if we follow them over time, this will, this will crank up, right? Like this will accelerate. So for example, we test our model with an ADNI. And then of course, like the one with Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and ADNI, based on our functional model, had way more accelerated brain aging than cognitively normal one. In Prevent AD, we didn't replicate um, the result within our APOE4 carrier. Happy to discuss about that. So the general conclusion of the talk, so not just this last section, but the general conclusion of the overall talk is that, you know, for me, Alzheimer's disease is really something that starts um, about 20 years before we give a diagnosis. I think that there are many factors that we can act on to try to postpone when the disease will start in our brain. I think that we need to start looking at what's happening before the disease starts, right? Why are we building some amyloid in our brain? What's happening there? Are there things that we can do kind of earlier on in life? And then despite the fact that we didn't found in our brain age model difference between APOE4 carrier and not, I mean, there, are, there is increasing literature suggesting that young children that are APOE4 carrier, their brain is a little bit different in some aspect than the non-APOE4 carrier. Same for cognition, actually. There are also study about that. So let's try to move earlier on. So I would love to do a CIHR and then check the brain of the children of my participant, right? So, you know, what about the one that we know that the parent have developed Alzheimer's disease? What type of brain is there? Can we already see differences within these brains? It's probably not going to work, but I didn't thought that Julie Gonu would found something with the um, Diane cohort. So, I mean, you know, why not? Let's see. I think also, as I told you, that, you know, it's about time that we put data together. We pull data together. We try to replicate our finding. And the field of Alzheimer's disease is moving in that direction. And then just to end, so Alzheimer's disease for me 
is really a multifactorial disease. And then in order to better understand the disease and prevent it, we need to look probably at multiple factor, genetic, lifestyle, and so on, across the lifespan, use multiple neuroimaging modalities, and also probably multiple data set to be sure that really capture the complexity of that disease. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank my team. So this is pre-COVID, and now, so most of the one uh, down there are here today. So uh, I would like to thank all of, thank all of them. Thank you.